Good afternoon, everyone. Can I ask everyone to take their seats and those who are sitting in the back? There's plenty of space in front, so maybe the middle front rows. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, on behalf of the Department of Communication, I'm delighted to welcome you to this year's CVS Sharma Memorial Lecture. Um, it's an occasion that allows us to remember a colleague uh, with a lot of fondness. Uh, he was among the founding members of the department. Um, and while we do that, we also have the occasion to engage with ideas that are crucial to contemporary media discourse. We lost CVS in uh, early 2006 and instituted the lecture series uh, two years later in 2008. And we have held it every year since um, with just one break during the COVID years. Unfortunately, none of his family members are here today. Uh, they were not able to uh, be here. But I'd like to acknowledge and thank them for their support over the years. Um, CVS's son, Tarun, is also a media practitioner. He's a, a documentary uh, filmmaker, and uh, we usually, and feature films as well. Um, and uh, he's usually here uh, along with uh, CVS's brother-in-law and sisters. So we will hear more about CVS from my colleague, uh, Professor Vasuki Belavadi, in a little while. Um, but I'd like to talk a little bit about the series and its importance to the department. Uh, the Department of Communication at the University of Hyderabad, as you all know, uh, has seen itself as an academic center that builds reflective practitioners. That's a key word that we bandy about a lot, key, key phrase. Um, we like to think that we uh, develop young people who acquire the skills and competencies to work in and with media industries, while also developing a critical sensibility that allows them to research and interrogate the social, political, and cultural dynamics of media and communication practices and institutions. This series of lectures uh, has created an opportunity for us to bring in speakers who are able to raise important contemporary questions and issues and maybe get our students to think a little bit more deeply and widely about these issues outside the classroom. The lecture series has featured both academics and practitioners perhaps more from the latter category, as CVS himself was someone who saw uh, himself as a bit of both with a bias towards creative practice. Speakers have come from diverse areas and addressed a range of topics, and I'll just mention a few. Uh, Sunil Abraham, uh, who was at the time with Center for Internet and Society, uh, Pamela Philippos, who spoke on the virus of uh, fake news, Shekhar Kamula, uh, who talked about the new wave of Telugu cinema, uh, A.K. Bhattacharya and Maya Merchandani, who both addressed in different ways the crisis in Indian news, and most recently uh, Vidya Subramanian on public mistrust in science and science journalism, and several other, others over the past 15 years. So this year we're pleased to have with us a journalist that many might say is at the top of her game, uh, Suhasni Heather. And again, a fuller introduction will be uh, given by my colleague in a moment. Um, again, thank you all for being here and joining us at the 20, 2023 CVS Sharma Memorial Lecture. I'd like to now invite my colleague, Professor Vasuki Belavadi, who is the Dean of the Sarojini Naidu School for Arts and Communication, to talk a, talk a little bit about CVS Sharma.
थैंक यू उषा गुड आफ्टरनून एवरीबडी थैंक यू फॉर कमिंग टू द सी बी एस शर्मा मेमोरियल लेक्चर ऑन बिहाफ ऑफ द डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ कम्युनिकेशन एंड द स्कूल आई वॉमली वेलकम यू टू दिस मेमोरियल लेक्चर बिग एंड स्पेशल वेलकम टू आर स्पीकर सुहासनी हैदर who as you all know is currently the foreign affairs editor at the hindu and uh, big thanks for her to for accepting to you know deliver this lecture the dr c v s sharma memorial lecture is organized by the department in memory of our colleague uh, dr c v s sharma who was one of the founding members of the department and uh, he joined the department in 1987 uh, just when the department was being established and we used to fondly call him cvs and uh, cvs as most of my contemporaries will also know uh, i was a, i was a student and he had this uh, knack of teaching us how to write visual diaries okay and that was the first step that he taught us before he took us into script writing and things like that we had to write visual diaries before we got into script writing and uh, there was also a time i remember when he taught us a little bit i'm talking about 93 95 he had already started talking about technical writing and things like that which became a fad much later uh he did his masters in communication and journalism from usmania university went on to work at uh, padmavati mahila university for some time before coming back to university of hyderabad and uh, he was also into poetry he used to write poetry and some of his work was also published on suleka the online magazine Uh, which was very popular during our days and uh, some of his plays he used to write short plays and those plays were also dramatized on all india radio he would go once in a while to all india radio uh, and you know this keep discussing things about what he did and his poetry and uh, the one thing that i personally liked about him was his uh, powerpoint presentations there would be three words on each slide and he would he would talk for about 5 minutes on each slide just three words on each slide uh so so that was his kind of you know uh communication and and uh, unfortunately he he battled with cancer for quite a long time and uh, passed away in 2006 when he was just 48 uh we also miss uh cve sharma's father who used to be a regular uh to this memorial lecture he also passed away about 5 years back and uh, his son like pusha said is a filmmaker uh based in mumbai but he would attend the memorial lecture whenever it you know he was in town uh each year we invite a distinguished person to deliver a lecture and this year we are fortunate to have ms suhasini haider with us welcome to you suhasini and welcome to all of you to this memorial lecture thank you so good afternoon uh, esteemed guests cherished students and respected colleagues uh, it gives me immense pleasure to introduce to you our distinguished guest speaker of this year's cbs sharma memorial lecture series the renowned journalist ms suhasini haider ms haider currently serves as a diplomatic editor of the hindu newspaper where she dwells deep into the intricacies of foreign policy 
Her articulate insights can also be found on her weekly online show, Worldview with Suhasini Haider, which is available on YouTube also. Her journalistic journey has taken her through the hollowed corridors of several prominent institutions. She once illuminated our screens as a foreign affairs editor and primetime anchor for CNN and IBN. Before that, she lent her voice and vision to CNN International's New Delhi Bureau. Over her illustrious 29 years career, Ms. Haider has showered her with accolades, a testament to her uh, uh, unearning de uh, dedication. In 2015, she was honored with the prestigious Prem Bhatia Award for exemplary reporting in diplomatic and international affairs. Her mental boasts other awards like the Haldi Ghati Award, Maharana Mebar Foundation Award, and accolades from the Limka Books of Records, NT Awards, and NBA Exchange for Media Awards and Indian Television Academy GR18 Award, to name just a few. She has relentlessly pursued stories across borders covering volatile reasons like Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Libya, Lebanon, and Syria. Her domestic, domestic tales are no less compelling, especially her brave coverage from conflict zones such as Kashmir, where she bore personal injuries from a bomb blast in 2000. Ms. Haider's association with CNN International saw her reporting from nations like India, Pakistan, and Nepal. She was a part of the CNN team that was awarded the Columbia Dewpoint Broadcast Journalism Award in 2005 for their Python coverage on Indian tsunami. Her foray into journalism began at the United Nations with CNN in New York in 1994 with uh, uh, secured, uh, into a pivotal role as CNN's New Delhi's bureau. Her academic credentials include bachelor's degree from Lady Sriram College in Delhi and master's in broadcast journalism from Boston University, USA. Today, she graces our podium to share her insights on diplomatic relations, journalism, and foreign policy. Without further ado, I request Suhasini Haider to deliver the lecture. Thank you. Thank you, and thanks so much for coming this afternoon. Thank you for inviting me to speak over here. Um, Professor Usha said, uh, top of the game, and I was thinking that, you know, as journalists, we spend all our time digging, digging underground. So even if you come to the top of the game, you're still on ground level. And uh, that's one of the journalists' uh, strongest points, if you ask me, is how grounded they remain. Uh, because uh, if you stop being connected to the fields, to the ground that you uh, cover, uh, your journalism will not take you very far. And, you know, eventually it is all about uh, credibility. Today I want to speak about what my life has been, which is covering really foreign policy, foreign affairs, diplomatic relations between countries, um, and as well as uh, some of the diplomatic mishaps. Uh, conflicts between countries, conflicts within countries. That's been more or less my field. But from that vantage point, because it's easy to say, I don't do this, I don't cover this, I don't cover that. Uh, eventually, journalists are generalists. We tend to look at uh, our profession in a very, very uh, similar light. Uh, so if I could just start by asking, because you know, I always think of the next generation of journalists uh, I, I see you not just as you know a matter of uh, uh, of pride. I really see you with a certain amount of admiration because it takes real courage to even consider this field uh, at a time like today. And I'll tell you why I say this. So if I could just start by asking how many of you are studying journalism right now? Okay, so quite a few. How many of you uh, would like to be journalists at some point, regardless of whether you're studying it? Well, there's still a few. Uh, how many of you look at journalism today with a certain amount of pessimism? Unfortunately, a lot more hands do go up over there. But I, I, I get that. I understand why that is. And that's one of the reasons why I'm here, because it's, it's important to make sure that people understand that if you're actually going to address this profession as it is meant to be addressed, you actually will have nothing less than optimism. You will actually have nothing less than waking up every morning looking forward to the story you're going to cover in the day, going to sleep happy and, and feeling fulfilled about 
having made some difference, some change, have somebody other than just your parents read your newspaper or read your or, or watch you on television. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, uh, it is one of the world's most fulfilling professions. Uh, and I know there's a certain amount of uh, um, surprise when I say that to people. Uh, but I do feel that this is a brave new generation that's even considering it because of the kind of challenges journalism faces today. We live in a time, uh, you know, the 20th century was known as the era, the, the information age. Uh, I look at today's century as the information shortage. So there's a shortage of information out there when you look at uh, what journalists are actually producing today. Um, there's also, this is also a time when it's not just that information is in short supply, but it's not as important or it seems not as important to verify that information as it is to get it out fast and first and perhaps make the biggest burst uh, with it. Uh, somebody um, who is now actually going to go and head CNN has written a book called uh, Enough Said. And I want to quote from him before I really, uh, you know, begin to uh, tell you a little bit about my career. Uh, he writes words, this is, he describes the times, and he says, words hurtle through virtual space with infinitesimal dis delay. A public speaker can plant an idea in 10 million minds before he or she leaves the podium. An image with an author and a deliberately composed meaning a plane hitting a skyscraper, say, can reach the eyes of viewers around the world with an instantaneity no longer constrained by distance or mechanical limit. Once, and not long ago in human history, we would have heard a rumor or read a report of it, days or even weeks later. Today, we're all witnesses, all members of a crowd that is watching and listening in real time. In a time like today, when everyone, and, I, and as I was coming into your institute, I saw uh, some graffiti on the wall that said, there are no bystanders. The truth is, we are all part of what is happening. We're all seeing it. There are those of you who will see me today speaking in real life. There are those of you who will engage with a YouTube video of mine. There are others who will splice and dice and take some of the words I say and make them into something else and put them up on Twitter. This is a, an age where you have to grapple with each of those challenges because what you're trying to get at again and again is the truth. What you're trying to get at again and again is information. Instant fame without any fact has become a, a, a one of the other markers of our times. It is possible today to be famous, pull likes, reposts, views, just because you are stating your opinion. And it isn't even an opinion of someone who's, you know, studied, taught, researched uh, the subject, but just has an opinion. Um, even the government, I realize, has begun this new, and I'm sure you've all seen it, you know, where cabinet ministers who don't give time to journalists in the field or beat reporters are now out there speaking to what are called social media influencers. It's, 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 it's a sign of our times. I'm not saying it's bad or good. It's a, it's a sign of our times uh, that they want to speak to those who influence people over social media, normally because they have very strong opinions, often because they're extremely young uh, and are, you know, uh, gutsy about putting those opinions out. Because as you, you know, as you grow older, and I'm sure you face it too as you go up the uh, uh, educational chain, that as you know more, you know that you know less. The more you know, the less you know. Um, we also live in times when it is dangerous to be a skeptic. Yet skepticism, the instinct not to take any statement at face value, the duty that journalists have to scrutinize each official statement or assertion and analyze rather than support every action that itself has become a dangerous activity. If you do so, if you ask those questions, if you are a skeptic, you will be trolled on social media, you will be named and shamed by senior politicians, you will be ridiculed on WhatsApp, 
and what's probably the worst, you may even be abandoned by your own media colleagues. This has been true of so many of the big stories of our time, from the Pulwama attacks and the Balakot strikes in 2019, also in that year, to Article 370 reorganization of Jammu and Kashmir, to what we saw recently in the violence in Manipur, and even the just exploded story this week of India-Canada tensions. Again and again, what you're being told from the outside, don't question. Again and again, as a journalist, given your training and given the kind of education that all of you are privileged to get over here, you, are, you know instinctively that to question is essentially your duty. So we, we come to a time when your profession has to be redefined by all of you. I would suggest you think of only two words. You know, Vasuki sir said there were three words on that PowerPoint. I don't do PowerPoints anymore because I think that people start looking at the PowerPoint and then, and, uh, uh, you know, give up on what I'm trying to say. Um, but, but if there are two words that I would urge you to think about your profession with, it is passion and public service. Half the problem that we have um, allowed ourselves as journalists, and I'm now talking about us in the, or who are already established in the field, as opposed to those of you who have to chart your course, is the idea that passion for what you do is somehow, you know, has somehow got mixed up with a kind of, you know, over exuberance or hyper nationalism or, uh, 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 you know, a sort of all, um, all in uh, with a political ideology kind of being. But the passion you need is the passion to actually do your job as a journalist. And you can't do it without the other P, which is public service. I keep getting asked, what is the business model for media today? How do we ensure that the next generation? of journalism graduates actually have jobs to go to um, because the, the media model sounds insane. If you are dependent on either a corporate or a state or on someone you know who is, is putting money into uh, the media or she's putting money into the media simply because they want a certain ideology propagated then how are you supposed to keep your job and do your job at the same time? Because you're, to do your job means to be professionally neutral, to go and ask, you know, ask truth to power in a sense. Um, but to keep your job becomes that much more difficult in this world. There's only one way to look at it. That journalism at the end of the day is called the fourth estate, but it is a public service. What you're doing out there, being the eyes and ears of people, trying to analyze, looking at what is happening on the ground and then um, putting that out for the world is eventually a public service. Others cannot do it, so you are. Unless you see it that way, you will, you, you, you will actually be very quickly disillusioned in what you're doing. Because the kind of work that a journalist puts in, uh, the way you lose friends because you can never show up uh, on time for a dinner, or uh, the, the sort of um, un, you know, the, the uh, unpredictab unpredictability of your day, uh, and the fact that family functions will get left behind, um, you will not be able to get your dog, dog food on time, because that's, that's what the profession demands. If you were to put in that kind of solid hard work and you know, sort of devotion and loyalty to, the, uh, to any other profession, you'd make a lot more money. You'd get a lot more holidays, um, but you don't. So the only reason eventually to do this profession, to be in this profession, is to have both passion for it and to see it as a public service. You are doing it because others can't. Uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a strange way, uh, that is true of every other person in public service, whether it is an NGO, whether it is a politician, whether it's anyone who thinks that they are working for the public. Eventually, you have to be driven by those two Ps. So to come back to my own um, uh, career path, and I started out in uh, 1993. Uh, so this year actually marks the, uh, the 30th year that I've been in the profession. Um, and I've seen a lot change. Uh, I started out my career in the United Nations, uh, which has 
formed perhaps some of my views about the idea of uh, what we now well know and speak about often called Vasudeva Kutumbakam, but the idea that somewhere there, there is a greater good for an entire planet. Um, diplomacy, however, the, the sort of diplomacy and the uh, uh, diplomatic relations we cover have definitely changed. How has diplomacy changed? Uh, one is, I think, and you probably see it uh, when you, thank you, uh, when you see um, uh, the coverage of certain visits, uh, certain meetings, is it's become a lot more result-oriented. You need to show outcomes. Uh, you need to always have something new to talk about. It's actually very interesting because as a, as a journalist, I can tell you, often we will see the same leader come twice in five years and actually announce exactly the same project. Um, uh, but you know, this is this is the sign of our times that everything must have, uh, you know, a result. Something is being done, and the result has to be immediate, uh, I, whether or not it it works out in the long run. And you know, a lot of the stories I get into trouble for are stories where we just ask basic questions like, uh, wait a minute, where's the money coming from? Or you know, you've announced this project, uh, but it's unviable or unsustainable. Uh, you know, how do you, how do you plan to go about it? Um, the second is that diplomacy today is driven a lot more by economic constraints and by the need to produce jobs. It's actually quite interesting that even the most powerful nation in the world, uh, its president uh, Biden or uh, before that Trump or even Obama, will go around the world and say, today I'm doing this great deal with this nation, whichever nation he has gone to, uh, and then talk about a project they're doing which will actually create jobs back home. And this has become a part of diplomatic relationships, that I'm doing a deal with you because it's going to create jobs for my people back home. Uh, so that's, that's where you can see how things have changed. Uh, a lot more diplomacy is, is driven by the need for resources, particularly energy. So it doesn't really matter in the long run uh, whether you 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 know you share the same values or you feel the same way about things. Uh, last year's uh, Ukraine conflict would have told you that eventually, when India was buying oil from Russia and increasing its intake of oil from Russia 50 times, they weren't looking at the question of the values. They were looking at the question of the resources and the energy that India was able to get uh, for a much cheaper amount. Uh, another thing that drives a lot of our diplomatic coverage today is connectivity. And I'm, I'm going somewhere with, uh, with all of each of these uh, steps, and I'll tell you why. Uh, another thing that, that we look at is the idea of connectivity. Even though a lot of connectivity is basically old connectivity that we had in the ancient times that we lost because of new borders or because of political uh, relations or because of wars or conflicts, uh, but that's another big part. And the fifth, I think, where diplomacy has changed is what um, uh, you know, uh, uh, Martin, Mark Thompson was talking about, which is photo impact. Uh, a little while ago, I was speaking to an ambassador in Delhi, and he was talking about a visit by a leader. And I asked, you know, what, what do you think is the big takeaway? And I was surprised by the answer, but now I think about it, it was a very honest answer. He said, what's the photograph, what's the photo takeaway that this visit is going to give you? And I thought that was really interesting that an ambassador who spent maybe 30, 40 years in the profession, talked about diplomacy, the importance of uh, countries working together, the importance of trade and all the rest of that. Uh, and eventually in his mind, he said that the most important takeaway I can think of is a great photograph. Um, and it's true. Think about it in the last few years. Uh, there was that picture of Prime Minister Modi and uh, the Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu in Israel in the, in the sea. Uh, and I can see a lot of you nodding because you remember it, you know, with their trousers pulled, uh, rolled up and, and standing in the sea. Now you can think about it and say, why on earth were they inside the sea? Um, you know, I, I mean, what discussion were they having while they were standing there that they couldn't have in, a, a, you know, in a, in a boardroom with around a table or whatever else? But it was not about the discussion they were having. They might have even been discussing their weekly grocery bill because what they were actually there for was that photograph. Uh, another one with uh, Prime Minister Modi and President Xi Jinping with the boulder behind them in Mamlapuram. Another great photograph. 
um, and honestly, you know, a prophetic one because who knew that Boulder was going to come rolling down the hill uh, sooner or later and the two leaders would not meet again for a long while or the rally that, uh, um, that you know, the U.S. President and the Indian Prime Minister had together, another big photo impact. Um, so that's how diplomacy has changed. Uh, and I'm sure that at some point you'll have, um, you know, diplomats coming here to talk a little bit more about that. What does that then mean for how our jobs have changed? To begin with, how our jobs have changed, and this is where it will affect you, is technology. Um, of course, now uh, it's not just that the jobs have changed, but the jobs are going away because of technology, because now people seem to think that they can use, uh, you know, chat GPT to, um, uh, to replace a journalist. I humbly disagree. I think that's where some of the most colossal mistakes will happen, because eventually you still need a journalist to collect the information. That's not going away. So if you're the kind of journalist who is committed to being on the, on the ground, committed to covering stories as they happen, to telling the story as you see them, your job is never going to go away. Um, it may become different. I, I mean, you know, I, I think in, in, in 95, I think when I'd come first back to India and I went to the Ministry of External Affairs, uh, it was interesting. We used to go there every single day, not because there was news happening every single day, but because the telephones didn't work. And you, the only way of really going to find out what has happened today was to show up there and if no official was willing to meet you, to make your way to the back of the ministry, to the telex room, and find out from a friend over there, you know, ki aaj kya ho raya kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> That's certainly how we, we started out. And we had to learn very quickly. We had, I, I'm from the generation that used pagers for the news. Um, and then found our first cell phones, uh, spoke on walkie-talkies. Uh, a lot has changed uh, now, and everything is available, everything is free, uh, everything is it's possible to do. Um, but I can actually remember big moments in my life, for example, when we had this thing called the Toko machine. Uh, long before you could just, you know, get on WhatsApp and put your video out live, there was something where you recorded a bit of video, you fed it into this machine, and then the machine used a, a sort of a network of satellites uh, to broadcast that out. And we thought it was just marvelous. Um, so now I'm really dating myself over here, but technology has moved very quickly. Um, but just as we learned how to uh, adapt, and learn about the new technology. And yes, I have uh, uh, looked at and even used chat, chat GPT, um, but I haven't stuck with it. Uh, the truth is, so will you. Your technology will will uh, change. Um, you know, I'm sure every month, and you will have to deal with things. Um, what has also changed is how that information comes to you, uh, because that information is now being fully packaged and given to you. Uh, you know, it's one thing to say I'm competing with the next generation for my job on television, but now we see even bureaucrats having to stand in front of a camera and say, today I'm standing in so-and-so place, the Prime Minister has just landed, and, and it's actually an official telling you all of this. So you want to say, you know, hold on, this is my job, um, but, uh, but there it is. So the packaging is much more, which means your job is going to be much more taken by unpackaging by looking at the threads of what you're being handed to question every line of what you're being given. Um, just not, not very long ago, the Prime Minister went to France and I received this long message uh, from the Ministry of External Affairs telling me uh, all the great things that were going to happen with this visit. Uh, and they actually included in that the idea that the Prime Minister was being invited uh, to, you know, he was there for the, uh, the Bastille Day Parade. Uh, and this was a rare honor. It was the first time an Indian prime minister uh, was being invited. And I, I, I called the person up and said, were you not alive in 2009? That's just 14 years ago. So you see, things have changed so rapidly that people are now not even bothering. You, you, you don't even bother to go to the Wikipedia. I normally tell uh, you know, uh, uh, young journalism graduates I work with uh, that I need two sources on everything, and none of those two sources can be Wikipedia. But even if you go to a basic Wikipedia search, you would know a little more than this WhatsApp that I received did. Having said that, it means that 
that's where the danger for you also lies because it's not just disinformation or misinformation it's actually just mistaken information that is getting packaged and repackaged and sent again uh, but it's becoming more and more slick so it's becoming that much more difficult and the only answer is go back to the basics go to the ground you know i had a a, a, a former professor when i was studying journalism whose answer to everything was go to the ground and i really didn't get the point of it until you realize in your profession that look for primary sources go to the ground go to where the primary source of any information is you'll be surprised how much easier it is than to get caught up in this constant thing of fact checking and trying to figure out where that first uh, misinformation actually came from um the other thing that's changed is the access to leaders which has just plummeted and this is not just in india around the world what's happening is leaders are spending so much more time in mass media in being able to reach out to their publics in uh, unchallenged spaces where they don't have to actually face questions they just have to sit on a you know on a camera or they do a town hall or you know they tweet um and uh, the idea that they would actually have to go through a critical eye from some cussed journalist is not very appealing to most of them so what you're seeing is access has plummeted in terms of actually seeing it i'll i'll let you in on a secret that you probably don't know everybody said to me you must be very busy with the g20 so i said yeah we had a lot of stories to do and that sort of thing so they said so you know like what was it like what did so and so leader look like and you know other and after a while i just had to stop them and say you know we don't actually go and see the leaders ourselves we sit in a in a in a media arena uh, where television goes on and off television goes on and off depending on what they want to see i mean i might be physically only 100 meters away from a leader but i'm close to actually seeing what their body language is or any video that comes out is actually already processed uh, by the government so we don't get to see it so it's getting that much harder to go to the ground and access has become that much more difficult um i often get trolled because uh, this is another thing you should remember that that photo impact can affect you as a journalist as well think very hard about what you're putting out there on social media today because you can be sure somebody's archiving it and somebody will pull it out when you're a senior citizen uh, and uh, make you feel uh, you know a little silly about it but i remember years ago maybe it was one of my first trips uh, on the prime minister's plane air india 1 as it was called uh and taking a photograph with colleagues and which we thought was a perfectly normal activity uh until somebody decided to tweet it as well and say here we are on the prime minister's plane since then that photograph comes up with regular sort of uh frequency and the reason it's coming back with frequency is to remind us that um for trolls at least uh, journalists are are critical of the government because they no longer get free rides on on a plane now at first i have to remind people who say this to me that i'm a journalist i don't pay for my air ticket when i go to cover a story my company does that for me so the free ride is in any case technically a free ride uh secondly what you're doing by by taking journalists off the plane cutting access to journalists from not just the leader themselves but the bureaucrats around them the officials around them uh, who can put context on a story explain a decision of the government is you are actually degrading the kind of information that the public that is paying for this plane to begin with is getting so i always turn around and say it's not really the pro- the problem is not that it is a free ride for me the problem is that you are paying for it and you should demand that you have more transparency when it comes to where your leaders are going what they're going to talk about how they're going to uh in you know enhance india's uh interests when they travel those are all questions somebody should be asking them and if it's not me and it's nobody it's it's no other journalist than you as the public are paying for it um another place where unfortunately and again you'll have to deal with this is that the journalist official contract has broken there's a very basic unspoken rule between journalists and officials around the world because there's a respect for a mutual respect for what we do officials are there 
They do very important work, and we respect their time, we respect what they do. Uh, they go through you know, years of training, they're in public service as well. Um, journalists have to be respected in the same way. What they are doing is equally important. What they are doing is equally institutional for any society. The contract between them has to be very simple. Don't lie to me and don't deny the truth. That's all you can ask an official. When you, when, when you go to do an interview, when you go to confirm a story, the only thing you really can you know, sort of uh, uh, rely on is that basic contract. Don't lie. Don't tell me a lie. Don't deny the truth. That contract has become weakened in the last few years, and that's something that you have to worry about, because sometimes officials will tell you something that's not necessarily true. Uh, and sometimes they will deny what is true. So again, this is a challenge. I, you, see, you see why I started by saying it's a brave new generation, because this is what you're getting into. Uh, and finally, building trust has become that much harder in uh, especially authoritarian times, populist times around the world. Uh, you know, there's this book uh, written by a Princeton professor whom I often quote, uh, which is called What is Populism? You can get it on Kindle, you can get it um, in, in the market. Uh, and it essentially looks at about 17 different democracies turning into autocracies. Uh, and I think the research was done around 2012, 2013. So we're not even talking about you know, India, the US, and any of the, the recent entrants to this trend. But he looked at these 17 or 18 of these democracies turning authoritarian, and he looked at what was common between them. And certainly, it was common, uh, you know, what was common was uh, corruption, who spoke against dynasties, who spoke uh, about, you know, meritocracies in that sense. Uh, and, um, and, and more and more, as they came to power, you saw other trends. There was a certain xenophobia, there was, a, you know, you see Hungary, you see some of those other countries. Um, and there was a lack of trust in some of the non-governmental institutions, i.e. academics, journalism, NGOs. And you see that across the world in different ways in different societies. Uh, so that has become another big challenge, that if there is a lack of trust, even in the public, for what you're doing, uh, the idea that a, a politician can today call you a prostitute or a fake news uh, or fake news as the US president, the most supposedly powerful person in the world once did, or uh, news traders, another word that's used often. The idea that people can do that now has changed actually how a journalist has to see uh, themselves in society. Uh, I, I'm sure these are trends, these are trends that will change, but eventually they will only be tr changed by one thing, and that's good journalism, and the good journalism that comes from the passion plus public service. So I get asked a lot, so I'm going to give you this advice anyway on what are the things you need to do. You'll all come to class, you'll all listen to the lectures, you'll all do your homework, you'll write your papers, but what is it that you need to do for yourself to make yourself able to deal with these challenges in the world. The first thing I, I, I think you have to do is to learn to read. And I know most of you are just going to look at me and say, yes, we all know how to read. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I used to, in television, I was in television for about 20 years, and I used to meet young recruits who'd come up to me and say, um, you know, I really want to join Tell the news, you know, at least 10 newspapers a day, at least, you know, uh, at least five magazines a week and, you know, find some time for a book as well. And they just look at me and go, no, no, we want to read the news, like, you know, be on TV. So I was like, okay. But, you know, what are you going to do when you get there? Because you can get there. It's not that hard to get on television. And certainly not hard these days. You just have to start a YouTube channel. Uh, but what are you going to speak about when you do actually get there? Everything you read before you read the news in that sense is what you're going to speak about because it will all come back to you. So I will say, read those newspapers, get on all those websites, make time. 
always have a book. Uh, I used to say in the good old days, always have a book in your hand. Now it's enough if you have a book downloaded on your phone and you read it in your spare time. But never be caught without a book. And let me tell you, just now at the G20, I just was walking out of the media center and I met what looked to me like a really senior official, um, which just tells you how old I am. Because he came up to me and he said, ma'am, you don't remember me. So I said, no. So he said, I would come to uh, speak to uh, one of his, he was a probationer and I'd gone to speak to them. Uh, and I'd given them this advice, you know, never be found without a book in your hand. Uh, and um, he said, I've, I've kept to that advice. And what it does is it inculcates a habit in you to at least make sure that you read one book a month. Uh, ideal if you can read a book a, a week, but that's normally speed reading. Um, but at least if you can read a book a, week, a, a month, that's great. You have a new idea, you have a new set of ideas coming into your mind, and eventually that all adds up. I'd also tell you one book that you must read um, and you're all going to think like, who's the author and what's the book that, you know, that, that, that I'm talking about. It's called The Atlas. Look at the Atlas, look at the world, Cyprus. So I said, okay, that's really an interesting thought, but I'm sitting in a studio reading out the news. Uh, what is this about? It turned out, and there was a backstory, uh, Israel and Lebanon had gone to war. Israel had built a blockade around the Lebanese coast. And so therefore, when the Lebanese war took a really serious turn and it seemed that you had to uh, evacuate Indians from there, and this is 2006 uh, that it happened, uh, the Indian government decided, because they had a fleet of na you know, Navy warships there, to send those warships into uh, Beirut Harbor in order to evacuate the Indians. So this was an Operation Sukun, as it was called in those days. Um, and it was an Operation Sukun, as it was called in those days. Um, and uh, I, I was told that I had to somehow or the other get on a flight to Cyprus, which is where the ship would dock and then take us on from there. Uh, and I remember thinking, you know, and, and everything happened in a whirl. I ran to the Cyprus embassy, which I found to my surprise was, uh, there was actually one. And I got my uh, visa, and I got my clothes together, and I got in a cab, I got to the airport, got on the plane, and that's when I realized that I didn't know where Cyprus was on a map. And I remember thinking, you know, I really should have looked at the atlas a little closer. So please do look at the atlas closer. Get a sense of the world you live in. Get a sense of your neighborhood. How many of you have actually traveled abroad? I see a few hands up. How many of you have traveled abroad to a neighboring country, one in South Asia? Okay. How many of you have crossed over a boundary, walked across a land boundary between India and a neighbor? Okay, so now we're down to two, three, four, five. And that's because we don't grow up with a sense of where our neighborhood is. We all know how to get to Dubai and get to Singapore and get to New York and go to Tokyo. We don't actually know how to even think about, and unfortunately, yes, you won't get a visa, so it's more difficult to think about, but think about going to Lahore or to um, Dhaka or to Thimpu. I know in Nepal, a lot of you would have gone for holidays or Sri Lanka in the, uh, in the old days also for holidays. But otherwise, you know, there isn't a sense when you go to other parts of the world, whether it's South America, whether it's Europe, whether even, uh, you know, the US and Canada, whether it's Southeast Asia, there's a real sense of moving in your own neighborhood, um, which we haven't unfortunately inculcated, but which uh, really would make a big difference to India's position and to our understanding of our region. So that's the first, only the first thing I told you to read. The second comes from it, learn a new language. You might think you're too old to do it, but you never are. Uh, there's a very famous uh, uh, anchor who uh, was, was created um, really because she worked in the BBC library. And when, I think it was um, uh, Yeltsin or was it Gorbachev, uh, anyway, one of them announced that there was going, I think it was Gorbachev announced that there was going to be reform in Russia. Uh, somebody walked into the library and said, does anyone here speak Russian? Uh, and she did. And her entire career was made by that. So learn a new language. You never know when you might use it. You go to a country, 
and somehow you are the uh, person who can speak the language there. Learn a new skill, which means essentially see the media as one. There's no point telling me that I'm a print media journalist, I'm a television journalist, I'm a radio journalist. I don't know if you do it anymore. Uh, certainly a lot of kids would come to me saying this, but the truth is that there's no such thing anymore. So if you write, learn to take photographs. Uh, if you're a camera person and you love that, learn to edit. If you're a reporter, get behind the camera. If you work for a paper, get online, blog, tweet, YouTube, all the rest of that. So make yourself the entire package because you are then in a better position to go to the ground uh, and get the story. Learn technology, and I've already spoken about this because whatever helps you get your story out faster is the one uh, that's going to work. It's, you know, uh, there's that old, I think, movie called Scoop, which was based on Evelyn Waugh's book, uh, in which you have the reporter call in a mining accident and then uh, you know, snip the phone wire. That's not happening anymore. Everybody's sitting over there. I, I, I remember some story I got last week where I had asked a question of somebody, uh, and by the time I had got around to uh, actually keying in the story, I could see it was breaking news in a half a dozen other places. So you no longer have the luxury of being able to cut somebody's wire off. Uh, the final thing I'd say <coughs> is learn your niche. Learn what makes you happy. What's the subject that you really enjoy? Um, and become an expert in it. One day you will be recognized for that, but before that what it will do for you is it will help you build your knowledge little by little in one niche. Nobody can be the master of all kinds of information and master of every kind of subject, uh, but learn what your niche is early in life and then keep building, keep reading about it, keep up with the technology uh, in the field again. I want to end over here, and I do hope to take questions from you, by telling you about a world that I joined in journalism 30 years ago. Some of it has still lasted, some of it has not, but I certainly hope that these are some of the values that we came in with, where I came in with, um, which some of you will find important. One, at that time, journalists were seen as neutral. We went into a conflict, and we were seen as genuinely neutral people. Today, when you are asked, as a journalist, and I'm asked this question a lot, are you an Indian first, or you're a journalist first? And the answer to that is that I'm both. But certainly, one does not have to change how I look at the other. I'm a journalist, that's what I do. I'm an Indian, that's what I am. Um, and I think it's important to remember that those identities also have to be put aside as you, as you actually go to cover a story. Um, there's a reason, you know, journalists will be told when you go in for conflict training, uh, and sometimes, you know, you get taken by the army and things, you will be told don't wear the same colored top and bottom. There's a reason why journalists will always wear jeans and like a white shirt or something or the other. It's come down the generations because if you wore the same color top and bottom, it was often seen as a uniform, whereas a journalist was away from the uniform. The journalist did not wear camouflage. The journalist did not need to be in a uniform or carry a gun in order uh, to cover the story because they were seen as neutral in the conflict. Uh, journalists went to the ground, as I said earlier, they're the eyes and ears for the rest of society. Journalists spoke truth to power, I hope that's still a value that matters. Um, in fact, often journalists led the way in terms of how to, you know, how to look at an international conflict. You know, Christiana Manpur, you see her now on television, but I can remember a time when uh, you went to State Department offices in the U.S. And they actually had a map telling you where Christiane was that week. Um, I mean, it was a fic fictional map, but they actually knew where she was. Uh, because they know that if the television cameras are going there, public interest is going to move there. And when, when the media says this is an important story, uh, governments actually have to stop and listen. Journalists were also seen as a voice for the voiceless. Um, whether it was, you know, in a conflict where even armed insurgents would actually want you to tell their story. Um, but the journalist had that position of the consumer versus the multinational. The journalist was with the voter versus the politician. The person affected versus any authority. 
So I would just end by saying we can still be that world. We can still build that world where the work of a journalist is eventually judged for how passionate it is and how much of a public service it is and how much that journalist went to the ground and build our careers really on the bricks of information, on fact, on research, and reasoned analysis. Thanks so much for listening. Yeah, please. No, that's whatever you prefer. I'm happy to sit if, if you prefer that. So we um, we have about half an hour for questions, and uh, we will have a roving mic. So if anybody would like to raise their hands, we'll take the mic to them. And yes, and Suhasini will answer. So we see a hand up. Maybe I can stay here and spot the hand. Hello, ma'am. It's fine. Yeah. Good afternoon. Tell me your name. Ma'am, my, my name is Parnal Nashkar, and I am doing ma mass communication, master's, uh, with uh, pra pra studies, media studies. So, uh, ma'am, my question is, isn't it better for the journalist to become slightly adversarial uh, to the government? Oh, absolutely, Parnal. And I, and, um, you know, from from your mouth to God's ears, as they say, um, I think there has to be a certain amount of, uh, of adversarial uh, feeling inside a journalist simply because it's not about the fact that somebody is from a certain party or a particular ideology. It's about the idea that the journalist will stay in the same place. Uh, you know, if, uh, those of you who are familiar with how we function out of Delhi uh, will remember that a lot of television is spent on a place called Vijay Chow, which is right at the base of uh, Naisina Hill, coming down from Rashtrapati Bhavan. The parliament is right uh, there as well. So you'll always see journalists on television speaking from there. And I often, uh, in moments of real hubris, because um, now on camera, I'm so sure you can say these things, I remember telling somebody who was um, particularly tough with us, but just remember, we stand over here, we watch people go up the hill, we watch them come down the hill as well. The majority of stays in exactly the same position. Um, so it is that. And, and whoever comes next, even if it's somebody who's you know, helped you out, or given you a story, or spoken to you another one, eventually if they're in power, you work out what you need of that sort of action. Ma'am, I have another question. Ma'am, uh, what is the uh, lacuna of America that after shifting their uh, focus from West Asia to China, they are again back to West Asia? Uh, are you talk I presume you're talking about Saudi Arabia in particular. Yes, ma'am. Uh, absolutely. And I think that is a cycle that you've seen with other countries as well. Uh, it's, it's not about a lacuna in any one country or any one policy. The idea is uh, that countries work according to their uh, they say they work according to their values, but eventually it's about their interests. Uh, and it's about where your interests lie. If you're able to find a way to work with somebody, uh, it, it may not matter what the values or, or, or what you share in terms of a, a shared outlook of the world is. Eventually, if you see an interest, uh, you, you, you work with that country. Let's take a few more questions, Pranav, and I'll come back to you. Yeah. Over there. You have to mind me first again. Morning, I am Dr. Uh, from the political science department, and I had uh, two questions for you. My first question was, uh, what is the gender composition of the kind of foreign affairs, uh, the foreign affairs newsrooms in which you often find yourself, and are there any particular issues that women face in such spaces? Nice question, um, and I'm so glad you're asking it, Ayan, because it shows that you have a certain sensitivity uh, to how female colleagues might feel in a newsroom as well. Uh, you know, the truth is that in journalism school, you will find, uh, I don't know if it's true of India, it certainly was true in the US, that the ratio of women to men in journalism schools was often more than 60 uh, to less than 40. But when you got into the newsroom, it somehow got reversed. Worse, when you got into the newsroom, the idea was always that if, um, uh, uh, if uh, you know, if there are certain tough beats 
military needs, conflict needs, and all the rest, those, you know, the men will take care of. Um, and, the way, and, you know, uh, I, I had a family member in the profession who said she used to get sent out to uh, cover chrysanthemum and flower, uh, you know, contests, and was very upset about it because she'd come from journalism school. Uh, so these biases that there are in society will always spill into the newsroom. But I think you'll find that as a profession, journalists are more progressive, do have a lot more, uh, you know, uh, understanding for the need for equality in the newsroom. Uh, you'll also find that because journalist is a gender unspecific term, over time, women have shown that they can cover a story in any situation as well as, as their male colleagues can. Um, you know, I was talking about that whole Lebanon experience and what was really funny for me is after all this, you know, jumping out of the newsroom, getting all, myself together and getting to Larnaca, which is in Cyprus, um, I got to the ship and they wouldn't let me on and then the, the admiral of the ship came down off the gangplank and he said, you know, you've put me into a real problem because I do understand you want to be part of the group going to Lebanon. But I have a ship with 400 men and then no other women. And I don't know what to do. You know, if you, if you think you can send your cameraman and cover the story from here, it would be a lot easier for everyone. So I was like, sorry, but can't do, you know. I mean, because when I go back, I won't have a job and all my colleagues who are males will have a job. I, I pleaded, I begged, uh, and he was a very, very decent man and remains a good friend. Um, and uh, he let me on. Uh, he not only let me on, I have to admit I got much better treatment than my male colleagues. I got my own bunk, I got my own room. Um, uh, and I had a great time aboard that ship getting to uh, Lebanon. Um, and, 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 you know, it was, it was something that made me rethink a lot of what we take for granted. But there are so many fields out there where there aren't other women uh, and then you know you suddenly be in the middle of it and how you comport yourself will eventually reflect on everyone else. So there are for all of us, there are so many role models out there now, um, which I think has changed how not just women see their own career in journalism, but also men too. Thank you so much. Uh, My second question was that you spoke about... Can we take some other questions and then we'll come back to you if we have to? Oh. God, it's becoming like a press conference, only one question, please. <laughs> we'll try and come back to you guys. <laughs> and you based on the Department of Philosophy. So uh, I was thinking, do you think uh, misinformation, do you think misinformation as a simple uh, causal relation with uh, creation of, a, of an ideology, or do you think there are pre-existing gaps in the description of reality? that where misinformation fills that gap and then an ideology is created. When I'm saying description of reality and gap in description of reality, I don't mean it in an informational sense. I mean maybe like uh, how, like a, some topic that social sciences deals with. That gap in the reality, that gap in the description of reality. All right. Oh, and, okay. and, and if that's the case, uh, does, does that put extra pressure on journalists to reform, reconfigure their uh, project. All right. If you watch the NEA's uh, press uh, press conference every week, uh, the current spokesperson, who's quite a fun person, uh, will always say, "PhD question." Um, so <laughs> that, that that certainly comes up there. Um, if what you're trying to ask me is is misinformation something that is done deliberately? or is basically because of a lack of information. Um, and, you know, and the idea that a political ideology is putting it out. I think at the end of the day, we have to go back to what are credible sources of information. We have too easily moved into new technology where if something comes to me from my uncle on a WhatsApp, it must be true because uncle doesn't lie. So the WhatsApp he forwards certainly will not lie. Um, it, it is necessary to re-engage with all of those ideas. What is your credible source of information? That's why journalism was created. Eventually, it was created to, so that people have credible sources of information. A journalist today has only one thing going for them, and that's their credibility. 
You think that way, I don't care, you know, how much money they make or how much uh, television time they get or whatever else they do. If they don't have that basic idea of credibility, if somebody is not going to them and saying, this person is going to tell me the real story, then as journalists, they're finished. Um, so if I were to invert what you were, I think you were asking about, is it doesn't matter how many sources of misinformation there are, or how many people are putting ideas out there that may or may not be based on a real, uh, on reality. It's eventually about rebalancing, if you like, in society the idea that credible sources of information are still the same. It's still, yes, people in authority are credible sources of information or should be. And if they are not, they must be held to account. They must be asked, why are you saying something that's not true? Journalists should be a credible source of information. Media must be a credible source of information. The idea that you can turn on a television in any channel, in any language today between 8 and 12 and 9, and all you've got on are people giving you opinions is something you should militate against. You should be asking, why is more information not coming up? of the media today. Why are why is opinion being premiumized in a certain sense? Uh, and that's where newspapers have been able to somewhere there at least roll on a little bit. Because you have your news pages and you have your opinion pages. Uh, even the opinion page has to be captured. It has to be, you know, it has to reflect reflect an opinion based on reality. So I think there has to be that configuration again. Just because you are looking at a statement, it doesn't become information. And, and unfortunately, the, uh, the old you know, social media world, new technology, came on us so quickly that it took us a while to figure out um, not just you know, how we were being manipulated, but you know, how easy it was for someone, you know, the old idea that um, uh, you know, a lie has gone halfway around the world before the truth can get its pants on. Um, is essentially true in, in today's era. Um, but that has to change, and it will change. I think people are tired of listening to other people's opinions, not based on fact. I think people are tired of, of journalists telling them, or people who say they're journalists, telling them, here's what you should think, instead of, here's what I know, now make up your mind. So I hope that answers your PhD question. <laughs> Go ahead. Hello, man. Uh, good evening. Yeah, I'm Vijay. Thank you so much for this. A uh, quick question, which is, we live in a world where facts are not the only facts available and uh, the truth is not actually the only truth that people speak about. So could you share with us any practical rituals to stay optimistic and kind of balance out what we consume as an um, well, I mean, I think the, the first is about the idea that, uh, and I think the most scary thing is that, uh, you know, to add to the tool that you said, is that seeing is not believing anymore. You can see something and it can be a complete, uh, you know, fake. Uh, so it, that's, again, extremely scary. I think um, everything has a smell test, which is essentially common sense based. and. Over time, and it's not even just over time, I think there's a reason why uh, today you might be told, oh, mainstream media is fake, or, you know, mainstream, me mainstream media is no longer popular. Don't go for the person who's telling you what they think is popular. Uh, because eventually, journalism is not a popularity game. If everybody loves one person, uh, you can be pretty sure that that person Maybe a great orator, maybe a great speaker, maybe very good looking, but it's not necessarily giving you any information. So look, you know, everybody has the faculties to think about what they're doing, to think about what they're listening to, to think about uh, what they prefer. Do you prefer to watch somebody, sorry to be political, but in parliament essentially abusing somebody, uh, using communal slurs? Do you really prefer to watch that? Or do you prefer to watch a reasoned debate in parliament where they're debating the rights and wrongs of women's reservation. I think at the end, uh, a lot of it will tell you not just about the person that you're uh, listening to, but about yourself. Uh, so, so become that person who's, you know, who questions everything, who reads everything with a critical uh, mind, and who watches everything 
with the idea that am I actually benefiting from this circus of people just shouting at each other and doing everything but punching each other out? Or do I need to get a reasoned debate uh, and turn to areas where you will get them? I, I know that it's not easy. I know that we're not giving you in the media, or the half of the whole media that I don't speak for. Um, we're not giving you, the, the viewer, that kind of choice at the moment. But I'm counting on your generation to change that. Yeah. <laughs> um, actually, I had a question on uh, access to politicians and uh, bureaucrats. But uh, since we have addressed that, let me ask a follow-up question on that. Uh, where do you see the business of journalism going, where uh, politicians can broadcast their message in a snippet, and they have their own internet machinery to boost up that image, uh, the message, sorry, and uh, in this context, the anyway, journalism has to fill up that uh, new space. So, in the in this process, as you said, uh, as you mentioned, that this is infamous information less age where the information is abundant, right? Man? So, uh, the snippet journalism, the snippet journalism, as I mean, what happened? What exactly happened? The snippet journalism is being replaced with the uh, broader journalism where the context, the history, the arguments. Uh, multifaceted or uh, multifaceted technology is being dominant. I mean, that is big value more rather than stupid journalism. This is what exactly what happened. Okay. This is what I have been seeing. And uh, if at all uh, stupid journalism is being replaced by either social media or citizen journalism, the in-depth journalism is being replaced by academic journalism. I don't mean academic journalism with its scholarly journalism. I mean by the value of the academics has. That is uh, posing various arguments, uh, posing the in-depth context, the history, background, and all that, the value of academics. I get, so, <clears throat> I, get, I get basically what you're saying, that the challenge is from so many places. Everybody else is doing the original stuff. What should the journalist be in terms of a value add? Um, and my answer to that will be very simply, it helps the politicians get their own message across. Because then I don't have to spend my time thinking, how much time am I giving this politician? Is it fair? I can link uh, the politician's statement in my report and carry on uh, with talking about it. Um, what you do as a journalist today have to realize is there is a reader out there, there is a viewer out there. And while I don't advocate the idea of giving people what they want, um, because I think it's a spiraling set over there because you keep looking at the least common denominator there, uh, I do believe very much that if you focus on your duty as a journalist, to educate, to inform, to enlighten your reader, viewer, um, or otherwise, uh, you will find the areas, and I'm not speaking just in the abstract here, you know, when COVID happened, there was a real rethink in a lot of newsrooms, because suddenly we were looking around, and people were too scared to pick up a newspaper because they may get COVID from it. They didn't want to read the newspaper, it was okay, they would see something online, and uh, they wouldn't want the newspaper. So people started to rethink, what is it that your reader comes to you for? You know what is really interesting? Is they starting to actually look at the readers and uh, the viewership on our websites, on our, um, uh, you know, on other things where it's easier to, to tabulate data. And they found that people went to different things, different platforms for different things. So if you watch your breaking news, you're still going to television channels. You know, if something big is happening, you're still getting the original input from television channels. Um, but for the context, you're going to certain newspapers. Uh, and eventually that's, uh, I mean, I, I write for the Hindu, I'm sure a lot of you do read it. Um, and that's essentially what we were told was our kind of, um, you know, what the context of what we were writing became. So you will find actually, and it's a hot tip for you, that often I will write 800 word articles. They won't, all those words won't appear in the newspaper, but they'll be there online. Because we know that there are people out there who want that extra context, who want the links, what are you able to tell me, what are you able to draw as a picture for me. Um, and I think as journalists, if you do choose the profession, you will have to learn, as I said, to, to bring all of those into one. There's no point now telling me, yeah, I'm, I only do this kind of journalism or that kind of journalism. If the politician is going on YouTube and putting their 
their statement out. How many people actually want to watch one and a half hours? Okay, not too many. But you as the journalist have the job to find the most important thing they said, or the most telling thing they said, and put it out there, and, and put the questions, and give the history, and say why this is heading in a certain direction, what are the repercussions in the future. Those are all still very important uh, missions, in a sense, that are not necessarily given by anyone else in society. There's nobody else who's still doing the job that journalists are doing. Can we bring it here? Yeah. yeah I have one mic. We have one. Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, good evening, Madam. Uh, as somebody uh, who has covered uh, international affairs for years, uh, my query is how much of a country's foreign policy can change with a change in the government? So, in our context of BJP uh, has come in the last nine years. What are the continuities or what are the significant changes that have happened in these five years? Right. Um, a foreign policy question, which is always fun for me. Um, but basically, can a government change foreign policy? Yes, of course. And governments do it all the time. You know, they change the um, uh, what their concept of allies are. A lot of governments come to power and actually make friends out of people who are adversaries. Uh, there was recently, I think, in Uzbekistan, a president who came in, uh, and the first thing he did was say, "I want to resolve all my border disputes." And you know, Uzbekistan is a double landlocked country, uh, so that became a priority. And so, in the first term, that's something they worked on. Was, I mean, there's always a cost-benefit analysis to what you decide to do. So, yes, uh, policies can change. Where I think policies have changed in India, uh, I'd say that there is a certain continuity. Uh, and I wrote a piece this week, actually, which we were talking about earlier, um, where I, I, you know, about the G20, for example. A lot of people have told me over the last 10 years, you know, all this, this old-fashioned non-alignment, you know, that's not going to work anymore. Uh, this is a new India, this is a brave India, it's not afraid to give its opinions, it's not afraid to make friends and alliances, that's all going to change. I've watched for nine years. I don't think that's changed. I think if anything, the Ukraine conflict crystallized for us how Indian policy has a certain base. And that's not a base that's coming from our leaders. That's not a base that's necessarily even coming from the last 75 years. In, in, Indian foreign policy represents who Indians are. Uh, Indians have a certain style about them. And I, and I think that's what it reflects. So um, my point was that the, the real winners in the G20 success that India has achieved in terms of bringing together all these different countries, and you know, the G20 is the last bastion, if you like, because there's the United Nations with 193 countries. Nobody can agree on anything there. Um, but apart from that, the, the real multilateral groupings are what? Things like BRICS which have one view of the world, or the G7, that has a totally different view of the world. So the G20 is a, one of the last bastions where everybody can come together. How is India able to pull off bringing them all together, putting them in a joint statement? One, India's belief in multilateralism, that it's not necessarily one country or um, a group of countries that can change uh, and decide for the rest of the world, but that people have to come together and sit on a multilateral platform and agree to a common minimum, whatever that they uh, agree to. The second was multipolarity, um, because it's often said, you know, especially post Cold War, war, that the U.S. had a unipolar world, and it did have that for about a decade or two. China started to rise and decided it wanted a bipolar world. One where there's the U.S. and then there's China. So in Asia, you know, that's China's area of influence. The U.S. they can take care of the West. So carve up the world is a bipolar world. But India has consistently said, no, there are other poles in this world. The global south is one pole. Um, the global south, where does that term come from? It comes from the 1960s. Um, uh, where does South-South cooperation come from? The original UN Commission on South-South Cooperation is, I think, 1956 or something. So these are old ideas that have always been with India, and in a certain sense, our traditional foreign policy. So they are foreign policy that is attuned to India's traditions. Um, and it, it is a voice that, that, has, uh, um, uh, that has always been 
what I was talking about, that voice of the voiceless kind of idea. Um, and the third, I said, was the middle way. Uh, and the idea that India is not going to say, I'm on this side, I'm taking sides with you. You're my friend, I'll do no matter what. Whatever, whatever you say, I'll do the same thing. Uh, we're not camp followers. We're not part of any herd. We will take a decision based on what's happening at the time. And I think the last year has shown that. So what has changed? Um, I think there is definitely a greater articulation of what India's policy is going to be. It's a much clearer articulation. When you see the prime minister of the country, you know, really traveling the world, what is he essentially saying? He's saying that I think foreign policy and diplomatic relations deserves this priority. We've had prime ministers who said, no, I need to stay home. I need to deal with domestic policy. But when a prime minister travels as much as our prime minister does, you know that he's putting a lot of emphasis on foreign policy. So foreign policy has got a certain articulation. I think it's also, um, in a sense, we have, you know, uh, people like the external affairs minister who, who really put a particular point of view across. Whether you agree with it or not is not the point. Again, it's part of uh, the articulation of the foreign policy. Um, and I think that there is a, a, a certain amount of um, shift that has happened within India as a consequence of the conflicts we have faced. Now, that can have both sides to it. So if your biggest conflicts and your biggest challenges are actually to your, your north, to your territorial boundaries from Pakistan and from China, uh, then certainly as a result of what India has suffered or faced over the years, the foreign policy has shifted away from these two countries. The shift from Pakistan and the decision not to talk to Pakistan, and I'm one of those who, I write it so I can't even walk away from these ideas, I'm one of those who believes that it's important to find ways to talk to everyone, including Pakistan. Um, uh, the shift from Pakistan has also meant a certain amount of retrenchment from the idea of South Asia. Because Pakistan is a part of it, we don't want to be a part of it. We have sub-regional cooperation, but we're not looking at South Asian cooperation. So there's always a guy, you know, there's an up and a down for it. Um, the one from China is more worrying because it continues. And um, as the standoff at the border continues, I think you'll see more changes in the way India has to work in terms of its tactical policy. But I don't think the philosophy of Indian foreign policy has actually changed that much. And uh, you know, um, just uh, I know these are very long answers, but what I always find very interesting when people say to me, you know, this is completely different, uh, this is completely new, I ask them to go to uh, the archives to 1946, and this is when the Constituent Assembly was meeting, and you know, there was a uh, there was a parliamentary discussion. What will India's, free India's foreign policy be? Sorry, not 46, uh, yeah, it was 1946, I think November or December. And uh, Prime Minister Nehru, who had the foreign policy portfolio, uh, the caretaker government at the time, stood up and he said four or five things. There's a lovely speech, you can actually find it on online. And those four or five things sounded to me like things we do even today, you know. Uh, the, uh, the, we see the earth as one family, as one world. That's something we talk about today. Uh, we will not be aligned with any superpower. It's something we speak about today. Um, we will uh, uh, be the, uh, it said we will speak against, in those days there was uh, colonialism and racialism, apartheid minister. So we will always be a voice against colonialism and racialism. You know, so there are like, I think, eight in all of these precepts, and I can share them with you. And I say, if you could just go read those, and ask yourself, how much has India's idea of its foreign policy changed in 75 years? You might say, not as much as I thought. Uh, this is what to do with uh, Pakistan occupied Kashmir. We all know that China is trying to build some infrastructure there, and Pakistan has kind of, you know, handed over, quote unquote, handed over some parts of be okay to China. And there is a constant debate happening over. Suddenly, the last uh, one month or so, I have begun to notice voices from the UK. From Gideon Balthazar. Which were kind of absent before one and a half months or two months. 
spoken about um, and I did try to do some digging. I looked, I, I listened to a few Pakistani commentators uh, who spoke about this as well and I want to share those with you. Um, my understanding is that there is genuine unrest in the region. Uh, in Gilgit, Pakistan in particular, uh, there was a demand that you reopen the road to Ladakh, um, which sort of signified and the, the whole point was that we are being cut off from trading in a normal way. You also have to remember that north of that region is Xinjiang, and an area that is so heavily militarized by China uh, that there's no way of going, uh, you know, in, in trading in that in that area. So what they were essentially asking was for the roads to be opened up. Now, obviously, many have turned that into a cry for freedom. Uh, I'm not sure if that's where it's leading. I'm not sure. I, I can't imagine that there isn't unrest in that side of Kashmir at all times. Uh, I've actually traveled to that side of Kashmir. I've actually gone through uh, with the Pakistani uh, um, uh, authorities and seen parts of those regions. Uh, and it seems very clear to me that uh, over the years, Pakistan has repopulated these areas. Um, you know, there was a huge, obviously, reaction from Pakistan over the reorganization of Jammu Kashmir and the hiding off of Ladakh, making Jammu and Kashmir into a, a union territory. Um, but Pakistan did that long ago by hiding off Gilgit Baltistan, making it federally administered in a different way. Uh, what they call Azad Kashmir, what we call Pakistan occupied Kashmir, and Zafrabad uh, was not actually given autonomy for years and years and years. Um, so. Uh, it, it wouldn't surprise me if there was unrest there, you know. There's a huge military presence, as you pointed out, uh, there's a huge Chinese presence in terms of infrastructure now. Chinese infrastructure construction often comes with a lot of, uh, of uh, you know, degradation of environment, local populations have to be moved and all the rest of that. Um, so, so I think that that is true. China is also planning uh, a railway line, a link between Tibet and Xinjiang that would go through what we call Aksai Chin, um, which is another point of worry, and could be one of the reasons that you saw uh, the LAC standoff also uh, happening. Um, so there is a lot of infrastructure happening on that side. I'm not sure if the political context that is being put to it is one that's going to play out. Uh, you know, I've also received the WhatsApp messages uh, uh, and the kind of ideas from everyone. At the end of the day, uh, you know, I do think that the, the problem in Kashmir will have to be seen from the point of view of today. Today we've been 75 years with a line of control between the two countries. That line of control is more or less stable. It's stable because both the Indian Army and the Pakistani Army have got vantage points where each one can, in a sense, has, the, has their advantage. They press their advantage. It's very difficult to destabilize a line like that without considerable um, uh, military manpower required and considerable casualties. Eventually, it will be about a cost-benefit analysis. But my sense is that if time, more time passes, and that LOC does not change, it is likely to become permanent. In that case, I think the only answer is for each state to decide to do the best they can by the people of that state. Uh, eventually, it's about humans. You know, we can draw a lot of boundaries, uh, and we bring up our children with a sense of the map that doesn't necessarily represent what we control. It's aspirational in that sense. Um, and now I see China has all these aspirational maps as well, uh, where they're talking about territory that they don't really have any control over, but you know, they, they give it a different name uh, and they put on a map with it on it. Um, eventually, I think we will have to look at the reality of where the situation is. Um, so I, I, I don't know if the situation there is changing to the point where there's going to be some kind of uh, rising, but you know, it happens. So I think that's going to be the last okay. question. Um, uh, because, and there is tea outside, so... Maybe I can chat know, with you, you all after. 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 So thanks, Mr. Masmi, for that great lecture.
Uh, my question is about how you place the importance of public service journalism. And it seems the onus of creating public service journalism is on individual reporters, individual journalists. What do you think is the role of the organization? Uh, because press freedom index is going down. Journalists are increasingly facing a lot of threat to their lives and uh, you know, well-being. What do you have to say about workplace policy on taking care of the journalists who are working? I think it's necessary. And I think, honestly, the market will sort itself out. As people who come into journalism for the money or set up media organizations just for the money to make the profit, uh, as they find that actually it's not making so much money anymore because credibility is going away, people are turning to other um, uh, you know, forms of uh, media information. As that happens, I think, in fact, you will find the people standing in the market are there for other reasons ideological reasons. So some of those ideologies will be public service, some of them may be just propagating a political ideology. And people will have to understand that there is that kind of uh, media in every country. A very, very right-wing media, very, very left-wing media. Those are ideological. Um, but the idea of public service is, I think, the most natural one. Why on earth would you do this otherwise? Because you're not making money out of it. So you're doing it because you think it's important uh, to keep a media organization. You know, my uh, master's uh, thesis was on American uh, um, media as a public service. Uh, and so we're talking 30 years ago. And I looked at uh, channels, and you know, I worked for CNN, which was a very pro popular and, and a profitable network at one point. Um, but I looked at the fact that when American news television was done as a public service. You know, many of you might be surprised by this. In the years before 24-hour television, people didn't really want to watch the news, right? It's a ball. I mean, who wants to sit over there and rather than watch I Love Lucy or whatever was showing at the time? Um, and uh, so the FCC in America mandated, I think it was in the early 80s, they mandated that half an hour every evening of any television channel had to show the news. 15 minutes had to be national news, which included international news. 15 minutes was local news. Now that was the model, right, in the US. Because it was seen as a public service. You make the money off the entertainment, and now it seems hard to believe that there were channels that had everything in them, but that's how it started out. Uh, you made your money off the entertainment, but you did the news as a public service. At that time, channels would have up to 20 bureaus around the world. NBC, ABC, CBS, all of them had journalists in Delhi, in Tokyo, in Moscow, in, you know, in Bagdad, everywhere. Um, then there was the advent of the Gulf War. And CNN came into the picture. CNN was 24 hours news. When CNN started out in, I think, 1981, or was it 80? It was called the Chicken Noodle Network because the idea was, you know, nobody is going to watch this. Um, and uh, it, they, they found in the Gulf War people watching, like, you know, I mean, we were like zombies. We would see one scud missile go like this, you know, and just keep watching. We didn't know what we were watching. There were some, you know, lights and flashing over there, but we were all watching, you know, this is the Gulf War happening. We're seeing this. And, and they didn't show the bodies, they didn't show what the impact of of the missiles was, it was just shock and all. Anyway, CNN did this, but then CNN, to be fair to them, did set up bureaus around the world. I was lucky, I traveled the world simply because, you know, um, CNN had a bureau in so many places and we covered so much. Uh, I worked out of the New Delhi Bureau, which was a South Asia bureau, but there was a week when we weren't traveling to Pakistan, to Sri Lanka, to Nepal, to Bangladesh. Um, you know, conflict, in fact, in the 90s, there were so many other stories to do. So CNN did that, but what happened to those other channels that were, you know, looking at uh, um, uh, doing news as a public service? The moment they figured out that CNN was making money out of the news, that it was profitable, they changed their models. Very quickly, the bottom line became important. The profits became important. The advertising revenue became important. They started shutting down bureaus because they weren't justifying viewer interests. The idea of sticky eyeballs, that not only must someone watch your channel, but someone must stay with your channel 
for at least 10 minutes or 15 minutes. Um, and they found more and more sensational news coming out. Um, so actually, in the days when the news was being done, as you, know, you were forced to do the news, you were forced to give people the news, as a public service, because people needed information, they were actually covering much more. Then, um, at the moment, it became profitable, and then it became about the bottom line, it became about cutting corners, it came about increasing profits, it came about the idea of year-on-year -year increase in profits. Whereas when you do public uh, television, for example, you don't ask what the profitability is. You do it as a public service. Um, so I think we have to go back to the model of what public television was without what public television has become, which is just a mouthpiece for whichever government is in power anywhere. Um, so I, I, I still think those ideas are relevant, and I don't think that it is possible to do the news with the idea that it will be both profitable and public service. You have to be willing to accept a certain, you know, a certain breaking even, not, you know, as all, as all uh, public trusts do, uh, without necessarily thinking about the profit motive, and that's when the news will really be supreme. So thank you so much, uh, Suhasini, for that and for answering the question. So I'd like to ask Anjali to do a formal vote of thanks. And well, we can wait until she finishes. Yes. On behalf of the Department of Communication, I am here to express my heartfelt thanks to all those who have made the CBS Sarma Memorial Lecture 2023 possible. I would like to start by thanking our guest speaker today, Senior Journalist Ms. Suhasini Heather, who took time out from a busy schedule to come to our university and give this very enlightening lecture on journalism and foreign policy. Thank you to all of you. I would also like to extend my thanks to the faculty, my colleagues uh, from the Department of Communication who put their minds and efforts together to organize this event. Gratitude must also be expressed to the Department of Communication office staff who worked hard behind the scenes for this lecture. Uh, thank you must also go to Dr. Janardhan and the media practice students who lent audiovisual support to this event. I would like to say thanks to the Office of Zafir Hussain Complex for letting us hold this event on their premises. And finally, I would like to thank each and every one of you, students and faculty, for being here. Thank you.